Welcome to this, a, a little special episode on the channel. Um, you can see on screen a V2 rocket, or you could have, I've now started taking it to bits. Um, that's because this episode is about something linked to the V2. Um, at the end of the Second World War, the British, Americans, and, and the Russians, or the USSR at the time, acquired V2 rockets. The, the British got a few of them, the Russians and the Americans, the majority. Um, however, this this created an opportunity in the minds of some scientists in the UK. In particular, two men, Harry Ross and Ralph Smith, came up with an idea for sending Englishmen, gentlemen as they were, to, to space. Um, and so what you see here is what they actually suggested. They suggested enlarging the tanks on the craft um, and replacing the, the nose of the craft where you normally have your, your uh, explosive device, your, your payload, with a capsule. And they called this Mega Rock. And their idea was we can send someone up into the atmosphere, out the atmosphere, and bring them back down. So we're going to build one in real solar system and, and see what happens. Please, can you uh, hold on for this one? Because it's a bit weird. So we're on the launch pad and uh, there we go. Just like any of the sort of V2 rockets, nice slow launch and we release the clamps and off we go. You will notice this craft does not have the distinctive fins of the V2. That is because it was proposed to remove them. In fact, they removed most, in the plan, they removed most of what made a V2 a V2 apart from the engine. Uh, the idea was to take the engine uh, rebuild some of the pumping systems, the, the turbo pumps and so forth in there, and, and also change the, the tankage. So they actually widened the V2 so that it was, um, it was about 2.18 meters wide. Uh, this all came about because of a suggestion that the V2 was almost about big enough to put a man on the top of, and this triggered this thought process. So they proposed that they would they would modify the V2, they'd give it a, a burn time of about 148 seconds, uh, they'd use its normal engine, and they'd fire it up with this little capsule on the top. Now the capsule was another, of course, creation of the, the British Interplanetary Society, of which they were members, and it was uh, supposed to be a an adaptation of their, their planned lunar capsule. Um, so it was particularly light. I have used a, a Mark II, one, two pod on it, on this because um, it's actually um, a, it's actually still heavier than the original uh, plan. The plan was to have a, a capsule of about half a ton, just over half a ton on the top. So I think they said about 586 kilograms. Uh, and for Americans, that's uh, 1,291 pounds. Um, I've also done something a little different, which is I've launched it straight upwards. Um, the original plan was, I think, to put it on a tilt and launch it at about three degrees. Oh, and you will see, um, as as you could imagine might happen with the uh, Air 4 engine, we have a bit of a problem with the engine there. So the engine actually on our launch profile, it lost a little bit of thrust. Now this is to be expected. If you're messing around with engines, you're likely to have a problem like this. I'm quite happy it's turned up, but. The original plan was for this craft, um, if it had gone properly, to actually make it to about 300 kilometers up and then fall back down. Now, as someone that plays Realism Overhaul or even Kerbal, the idea of something coming down on, an, on a, so, a, 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 sub, a suborbital arc, a, a ballistic sort of landing, um, is quite scary. They they actually suggested that the craft would have a range of different parachutes to allow it to do this. And you'll see that actually, here we go, we've lost our we've lost our little cover that was on the top there. That was part of the plan they had. They had this whole top section that would come off in one, and then the capsule itself would be released near the near the sort of peak of their their, their arc, uh, near their apogee. Um, and it would allow the person inside to look out through a little window and see what was going on and do the experiments they wanted to do. Um, the return plan was quite interesting. Um, obviously they're coming in from 300 kilometers. We actually only got up to about 190 and I would actually suggest that any higher than that and you start to get uh, problems, I think. So the interesting thing, and as somebody that's, that's played a lot of RO in the past, um, they suggested that they actually have a parachute that deployed 113 kilometers. 
So I've actually I've modified one of the parachutes to do that. We have a parachute that's going to actually trigger at 113 kilometers, um, which is a really interesting idea because obviously, as soon as you get into the atmosphere, you do have uh, air resistance, but it's very thin and you are accelerating due to gravity. So if you do a ballistic arc like this, the rate at which you are falling through the air and it gets thicker quicker you don't really lose your speed that quickly and you can actually you can have some real problems with overheating and um and g-force particularly but what they actually wanted to do was have a set of parachutes that would open in a staged approach they were going to be uh, planned so that they would actually be, they would bite less into the air in almost in effect as you got lower down to try and maintain the g-force and they predicted they could if they were clever get g-force that were about 3.3 g or around there all the way through the descent. Obviously this was a paper rocket, it never got built, but it was quite interesting to see the idea of using a range of different parachutes. So there we go, there's our first parachute. This is our like our drug parachute, and it is a long way up. You would never normally have a parachute open up like this. You know, you are, you're on the edge of space. Now actually, we opened the parachute above the Kármán line. Um, and it is, it does actually, if you look at the speed, we're not we're not slowing down, our speed is increasing, but it's not increasing by as much as you would normally expect. It's not increasing by the rate of gravity anywhere near that. So that parachute's having some effect, not a massive one, but it's just, it's helping a little bit. And I, I would actually say, I, I should probably have repeated this without this parachute in particular, just to see what the effect was, but because the engine had a fault, I couldn't reproduce it accurately. And I thought the engine fault was lovely. Obviously, as we go through the parachute, at about 50, uh, 50 kilometers has obviously had a problem, too much air movement there, it's too thin or it's moving too fast and it's burning up, it's ripped up. And you know, you could imagine that actually you could you could divine a parachute that would work a bit more gradually than that. Obviously, real chute is not designed for this model. It'd be really interesting to see what happens. We, we drop a bit further and we're actually gonna open a parachute at the normal sort of parachuting range that you'd have um, preset. So there we go, about about five kilometers up, we've opened our parachute and all the way down, our actual G-force has not been too bad. Um, the actual pull that we've experienced on this ballistic, ballistic arc has not been bad at all, actually. Um, so I do think that the parachute's got something to do with it. The capsule is twice as heavy as it should be for this rocket, but it's really quite cool. So Mega Rock was basically the way for the British to get themselves into space and get their first man into space. So it was proposed in uh, in 1946, as I've said before, by Harry Ross and Ralph Smith. They actually wrote it up and they submitted it to the government as a proposal. It was rejected because the government didn't really see the point. There was no real sort of drive to do it and there wasn't the money to do it as well. Although it was a single one-off thing, there wasn't the money to do it. Um, however, the Russians also had, a, or the Soviets had a similar uh, idea, and this came from Tikhon Ravov. I can't even say his name. I might put it in the down there, or if somebody reminds me, I'll try and put it off. But if you actually look it up, Tik Tikhon Ravov, um, and he actually came up with a very similar idea, but with even less modification of the V2. Um, but again, he in his situation, it was a case of Stalin basically deciding that the V2 production would go to back to to. The USSR to Russia and you know Germany would be left without anything so it got sort of watered down so here we are our little capsule with our little Brit now interestingly launched from Wimra I actually don't know where the proposed launch site would be for this it, it's not really been suggested um, the interesting thought was that the 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 line the 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 rate for which this was going to take time to do was predicted to be about two years so potentially a British astronaut would have been in space in 1948, which would have been, what, 10 years before Yuri Gagarin, which is crazy. And it's very, one of, I think, one of the most British ideas ever is to, um, to have actually <laughs> just fired a rocket up. It was very Jules Verne-y sort of, you know, that sort of vibe. So with that, it's a nice short episode. Go and look it up. I'll put some links down below. Look it up. Have a look at the Mega Rock and uh, enjoy yourselves. And until next time, have a great one.